Welcome back to the Structured Cabling Lecture Series, lesson number four. Today, we will cover categories of cables. If you haven't seen my previous lectures, I will post a link in the description for the playlist. Remember from the previous lecture that I have introduced you to the categorization of cables. Those include the CAT1 going all the way up to CAT8, and in the future, there will be more categories added to it. I mentioned to you that the category one, two, and three is mostly used in the telecommunication industry, but at the category three level, 10 based T ethernet uh, came into effect, which is uh, giving us about 10 megabyte per second data rate. And then CAT4 is a special cable that is used in the token ring system that basically went out of uh, favor uh, very soon after it was introduced uh, later that uh, you know decade. We have now CAT5 and CAT5e, CAT6, CAT6a, CAT7, 7a and 8 in the market. Uh, what very common modern day uh, in our network system is the CAT5, CAT5e, CAT6 and CAT6a. So from CAT5 to CAT6a, these couple of uh, items right here, these categories are the most common cables used today in the networking industry. Again, recall from my previous lecture, the reason why we have these categories that we have used these categories to standardize the minimum uh, bandwidth and data rates as well as the maximum distance associated with this. So it will, be, for example, if you go to any manufacturer and buy a category 5 E cable, you are expected to uh, have the maximum data rate of one gigabyte per second with a band uh, width of maximum 100 megahertz with at, uh, up to 100 meters. So what this categorization is doing is giving us a guaranteed of minimum standards associated with each of these types. So today I'm gonna cover a few items and one of them would be buying ethernet cable for your network. And what we need to think about when you are trying to buy a cable is the speed or data rate which the cable can support, the shielding, cable length or distance, installation location, cable styles, and cost versus uh, benefit analysis. So I just corrected a spelling mistake. This should read cable style. So in the next few slides, I will go over some of these items in depth. Uh, but for now, I'm gonna give you a brief overview of each one of them. And uh, I will not cover everything in detail in this lecture, just to keep the lecture short. For example, cable style is basically, you know, the style of cable you use. So there's not really much to discuss there. So I will uh, basically briefly discuss that over and move forward, okay? so. When it comes to my speed, which is also sometimes, uh, you know, associated with what we call the data rate, which is associated with that anyway. Uh, and the speed of the cable refers to the amount of data it can transmit per second. So for example, when we say 100 megabytes per second, that basically means the cable can transmit 100 million bits of data every second. In commercial network, speed is usually uh, dictated by the equipment uh, that you will be connecting to these cables. Like for example, a network switch with the gigabit ethernet ports uh, will support up to 2000 megabyte per second. And even if you have a cable that may be supporting better data rates, uh, that will create a bottleneck for examples, right? So for example, if you have fiber optics cables everywhere, but you are main switches in the main uh, distribution uh, network is, only 100 or 1000 megabyte per second is not going to go any further than that, right? So keep that in mind. So that's that speed of which the cable can support is important. But just because of you're buying a better speed uh, rated cable doesn't mean your network going to be inherently faster. So in home settings, uh, you when you're choosing uh, cables, you need to think about, you know, the internet connection uh, and type of uh, connection that you need, uh, how far uh, that you're gonna uh, pull these cables uh, between uh, different endpoints or different uh, intermediate devices such as switches and routers within your house. So again, I'm not gonna go into detail right now, but I will discuss a little bit more in depth in the next few slides. Uh, 
The next thing is shielding. Uh, so some ethernet cables are shielded to protect cables uh, from electromagnetic uh, interference and some are not. Some shielding have also environmental protection, which I will discuss in next few slides. Same with the cable length and distance. It has to do with, uh, you know, uh, how far the cable can be put to uh, put between uh, either end device and an intermediary device such as a switch and a desktop computer or in between intermediary devices such as between two, two switches for example uh, before the signal start to degrade so how far the distance um, you know that the cable can handle uh, Installation location, whether you're going to put the cable inside the building or outside the building matters. That will define, uh, you know, what type of cable you would purchase. Cable style, as I mentioned, is a very minor detail, but it does, sometimes does matter because there are some Cat5e, Cat6 uh, Cat uh, and Cat6e uh, e cables uh, that may have a certain style. Like, for example, Cat5e, you can get a flat cable where the, all the wires are flat so that it easily can be rollable or put it inside uh, some kind of a, a enclosure, for example, compared to the regular uh, Cat5e cables that you see, which is a rounded jacket. Uh, so that's what I meant by cat, uh, cable style. And finally, cost versus benefit analysis. So if you are working for a small business or whether it's a large corporation, you need to think about the cost associated with buying these cables. Again, some of these items I'm gonna cover in the next few minutes uh, and except uh, there's some things like this cable style. So recall from my previous lecture, the cable shielding uh, the information that we went over. We discuss about the UTP, STP, FTP, and I briefly went over what F, uh, UTP, S, UTP, and SFTP means. And here is a summary of that. So this is where the cable shielding uh, become a, a something that you should be aware of as a cable installer or a structured cable uh, cabling engineer. Uh, so for example, UTP would have a twisted pairs like this and you have a cable jacket and between these twisted pairs or among these cables, there is no separation. But when you come to the point STP, the cost is a little bit higher, but now you will have a shielded uh, a shield outside plus a shield between, uh, so the, sorry, you have a jacket outside which is kind of a shield and then you have a shielding between each of these pairs so each of these pairs are separated with a shield with uh, uh, ftp uh, we will have foil instead of just a plastic or some other form of uh, shielding uh, to separate these things which will give you a better uh, electromagnetic uh, separation in many uh, situations and then futp will have a jacket outside but right after the jacket, you will have a foil um, uh, right beneath it. Then you will have SUTP. Uh, again, in this one, we have a jack cable jacket outside. Then we're going to have a braided shield in this case, which are typically used also in outside environments. And that's why we use that type of cable. And when you have SFTP, we also have a cross divider like this. So in addition to foil shields uh, between each twisted pair, in addition to the cable jacket and also a, another, uh, you know, braided uh, shield out uh, right beneath it. We also have a actual divider, like a plastic divider uh, between each of these pairs. Again, it, the cost going to go up as you move from this end to this end of this diagram. But there are use case scenario that you really need to use this kind of a high end cable in for your cable installation purposes. Again, I'm not going to go into in-depth analysis of what are each of these scenarios are in this lecture. I'm just introducing you right now. I will go over that in maybe in future lectures if we have time to cover those uh, items. But keep in mind what really important in this slide is that there are these different types of uh, shielding, cable shielding, and they are denoted by like UTP, STP, FTP, etc, etc. And you need to know what they are uh, in a general sense as a cable installer. The next topic we're going to discuss is the cable length. So the maximum length of a CAT5e or CAT6 Ethernet cable is about 295 feet, which is about 90 meters. 
how we get calculate that 295 feet or 90 meter is that we also accounted for up to about 16 feet which is about five meters of patch cables uh, on the ID, uh, either end uh, of the cable so for what i mean is that the cat 5e and cat 6 is actually rated for 100 meters but we typically don't go more than 90 meters uh, between uh, devices or uh, between endpoints because we may want to put a patch cable uh, on the either side like for example we have a wall uh, socket here and let's say there's a switch in between and we have a wall socket in here we can put 100 meters between the switch and the wall socket and the switch and the wall socket but if there is no switch or intermediary devices in here it's going from socket to socket so let's say this is a patch panel right here and this is a wall plate right here the we typically only go maximum up to 90 meters why because from the patch panel to your router or a switch uh, we can put up to five meters of patch cable and from the wall plate to your device we can put up to about five meters or 16 feet of uh, patch cable hence uh, the total add up going to end up with 100 meters or less if you put a cable or the, the cable distance between endpoints more than 100 meters. If you put a cable more than 100 meters between your end devices or between your end device and an intermediary device such as a, a router and a laptop computer, what will happen is that the signal attenuation. So just because of you have a CAT6 cable or a CAT5E cable that is more than 100 meters, a little over 100 meters, let's say 105 meters long cable, doesn't mean you suddenly use, lose your internet. It doesn't mean you suddenly have a network connection issues. But what most likely gonna happen is signal attenuation. So basically longer the cable, more the signal going to degrade and with certain conditions even under 90 meters you may or even under 100 meters you may experience some signal attenuation such as due to electromagnetic interference right so if you have a 110 115 120 meter cable cat 5 e cable uh, you may have network connection you may be able to access your network drives and everything but maybe the speed at which you can download data from your network connection may be slow due to signal attenuation if you have a wireless access points uh, that are connected at the end of the uh, 110 meter cable of CAT5E that may create intermittent network connectivity losses that may create a situation where uh, your access point go out of service once in a while as a result of it. For example, there was a situation uh, that uh, I've been told where they put a a net cat 5e cable about 110 meters to a an access point ap and during the uh, the night and during the early morning hours the cat the, the access point works just fine but during the day when a lot of people in the office try, are connecting to the wireless network the access point go out of service so it lose connectivity so why is that happen? Well, because that cable between the access point and the end, uh, sorry, intermediary device, which is a switch or a router, is more than 100 meters, about 110 meters. So during the early morning hours or late at night, nothing might ha happen, much happen because there are not enough conjection in the system to cause a problem. But during the daytime, when everybody in the office trying to connect to that access point, the issues start to pop up and th the reason is the signal attenuation now if you have a cable that is like 300 200 meters long and it is a cat 5e cable you may also even completely lose the signal at all uh, completely and you may not get the connection at all but if you have like 110 120 meters which is just above the 100 meter uh, you know maximum you may have signal attenuation that will uh, intermittent uh, for example so keep that in mind the next thing I'm gonna uh, briefly discuss is the cable style. So uh, there are cable styles that are called the slim or ultra slim cables. Uh, those are cables that have diameter that are typically 30 to 50% less than that of the standard CAT6 cable or CAT5E cable. And those are manufactured uh, from a small, uh, smaller gauge copper wire and four pair uh, standard cables increase 
sorry four pair standard uh, stranded sorry four pair stranded cable increases airflow in you know uh, crowded equipment uh, racks which helps the keep the component cool and functioning properly so basically why would you you want to use a ultra slim or slim cables maybe be, because your network closet have way too many wires and your um, network engineer or if you are a network engineer or a network administrator you are trying to keep those cables as tightly as possible Another reason why somebody might go with the slim or ultra slim cables is to uh, aesthetics purposes. So if you have, for example, a TV with a network connection hooked up to a crowded area, let's say uh, an airport, for example, that displays uh, the flights coming in, you may not want to put a huge, uh, you know, thick cables onto it uh, for the give it a network connection. You may want a very slim cable that goes through the ceiling tiles, goes through the, the tube that is connecting to the, uh, the roof of the ceiling tiles, for example. In that case, also, you might use a slim cable. Uh, flat cables, uh, so basically, uh, although they are not common choice, the flat cables have some unique characteristic uh, that makes them beneficial in certain applications. Uh, flat cables uh, uh, have good heat dissipation, for example, and more evenly distribute the physical loads uh, on the cable. So they also uh, have the also they have the ability to bend uh, easily as opposed to a rounder say, cable. So the flat cables are uh, some of the cables that sometimes comes in the box with some of the switches and routers, like the consumer switches and consumer routers. Basically, all the cables going to be uh, very flat. The difference between a flat cable and a, a slim or ultra slim cable, slim and ultra slim cable also have a change in uh, gauge of the wire. Flat and ultra slim cables are pretty similar to each other in that, in a sense, they are not round cable. They are not like tube-like structure. They have a flat, you know, flat... Uh, you know, uh, you know, surfaces. So that's what the, it mean by flat cable. Um, actually, uh, let me show you some uh, pictures. Here you go. Uh, I post the video and got a picture of a flat e Cat 7 cable uh, from the Amazon website. So as you can see, this this cable is very flat. So the cable that you have seen often time is the round cables, uh, and this is an example of a flat cable. So that is good for like tight spaces and keeping things neat etc etc so i should have put this picture earlier on so i just added right now so that you can see that what it what i'm what i'm talking about uh, then you need to consider things like solid core cables versus stranded cables so the in network cables basically when you look at uh, the type of network cables that you can buy there are two types of uh, cores that you can find one called the standard the other one called the solid uh, wire format as the name suggests, the solid core cables are the one that use solid copper wire uh, of uh, each of these conductors. For example, each of these conductors will have a solid uh, copper wire inside right there. I have introduced this concept in my previous lectures already, so I'm not going to go into depth of that. But what you need to understand is the solid conductor cables are typically used in infrastructure level. In other words, when you are putting wires across uh, uh, you know uh, the uh, the the ceiling tiles, or uh, you are putting wires across uh, uh, from wall pl plate to the switch or router. You typically use the solid core cables, as opposed to standard core uh, cables uh, are typically used for patch cables because standard cables are more flexible as opposed to solid wire cables. But solid wire cables are more uh, long lasting. Uh, in in the spaces where you don't need that flexibility, for example, for horizontal cables runs in other uh, in other words, uh, it, it is suitable to use uh, solid core cables. And also, uh, the research shows that when we have power over Ethernet uh, or outdoor applications, the solid core cables tend to last longer and performs better as opposed to standard cables. So what you need to remember is for all your patch panel needs, you typically go with the standard core cables, while infrastructure needs, such as putting, uh, you know, uh, a, a power over Ethernet, uh, you know, let's say access point, you typically use the solid core cable inside the, uh, you know, ceiling tiles, for example. So that's what you need to understand. Again, I already have covered that, so I'm not going to go into any more depth. And the next one is the armored uh, cable. Uh, the, so the armored cables have a outer jacket uh, that are armored 
to basically resist uh, environmental uh, conditions uh, as well as to provide some protection from other factors, including, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, in environments where you may not need to put a cable uh, where uh, it may be exposed to uh, extreme factors. So applications where location is potentially uh, involved maybe crushing or a bending of your cable. Uh, for let's say uh, you have a network cable that you need to put it into an industrial application where a, some kind of a, a device is moving. Let's say it is a manufacturing device and uh, the 3D printer or uh, uh, the, this, this manufacturing arm is always moving up and down and to side to side. I would typically use an uh, armored network cable in that situation because that will protect that cable from bending too much and breaking it off and also will protect it from environmental elements. Also, if I have to put um, cables in uh, places like sawmills, for example, where there's sort of uh, dust and heat and everything, I would also prefer to go with armored cable in that kind of, in kind of environment. So any kind of a environment where it is harsh environment conditions, industrial applications such as, you know, the warehouses, I would use armored cable. In fact, Amazon is currently building a warehouse in uh, near uh, Alberta, Southern Alberta, and they're actually using armored cable for everything inside the building. I actually seen uh, that on somewhere on the news. So there you go. That's an app real world application of why somebody would pay the money to buy, buy armored cable because it give all that protection, extra protection for cable. So what, keep in mind, when I'm talking, discussing about solid core cables, we actually talking about what the cable inside, these are these wires inside, not the cable itself, but actually we are talking about the wires inside. But when we are talking about armored cable, we are talking about the external like seat, like, you know, the, the, the external protection that we are talking here. So keep that in mind as well. So what I mean is that you can have armored cable that are solid core. You can have armored cable that are standard core. So keep that in mind. So, you know, those are combinations you could get. Next thing we want to discuss is the gauge. Gauge is not only important to networking and network engineering, but also important in electrical applications and electronic applications as well. So if you have taken any high school physics classes uh, in Canada, you already know what a gauge is. So this is a basic fundamental concept every high school graduate should know. Uh, even younger than that nowadays, I don't know how the education system has changed. Uh, so the if you have taken any high school physics classes, even science classes, we know that the smaller the uh, American uh, wire gauge, also known as the AWG, the bigger the conductor diameter. So in other words, if I have a gauge 20 wire, that actually gonna have a bigger diameter than gauge 28 wire. So it is uh, opposite, it is one over, you need to think about one over, or opposite. So smaller the gauge, the bigger the conductor diameter. Keep that in mind. So the, the conductor diameter size is measured in American wire gauge, also known as AWG, or we sometimes call just gauge. And that is an imperial unit, and that is mostly used in Canada and the United States, but also used all over the world now because of the Remember from our, our first lecture, because of the popularization of this kind of standardization by companies like AT&T and Bell Laboratories, those happen to be American companies. Therefore, you know, AWG gauge is being used almost all, uh, you know, everywhere in the world. However, there are also uh, square millimeters uh, in use, which are called mm uh, squared, square millimeter. And the conversation, sorry, the conversion uh, between the AWG and the square millimeter is not always one to one. In other words, the gauge of 20 doesn't always translate into a specific number in the square millimeters. So there is some conversion factors you need to take into account. Typical sizes, what you need to keep in mind is that for data communication is gauge 20 all the way to gauge 28. 
Keep in mind, gauge 20 have a bigger diameter conductor compared to gauge 28, have a smaller, tinier diameter conductor. And for electrical, uh, we have uh, gauge 18, uh, 16, 14, and 12 uh, for both uh, residential and automotive uh, electrical uh, items. So if you have a vehicle, that those vehicles will have gauge 18, 16, 14, or uh, 12, and same in the home uses uh, as well. Keep in mind again, data communication is a higher, bigger gauge compared to a electrical. Why? Because the electrical wires need to be more, uh, you know, uh, more uh, bigger in diameter to support that electrical conductivity as opposed to data communication we probably dealing with uh, less than 50 volts or around 50 60 volts maximum uh, as opposed to this is 250 volts 110 volts uh, with a high amperage as well uh, data communication is very low amperage so we can get away with using higher gauge wires which result in lower diameter wires as opposed to lower gauge wires which gonna have a higher diameter wires and higher cost so for much larger industrial applications, uh, you know, uh, we use also some specified uh, gauges that sometimes not even standard. So for example, if you are using industrial electrical applications, you might have some weird gauges that, uh, you know, you will be installing. But you don't have to worry about that as an IT professional. What you should be worrying about as an IT professional is the gauge about 20 to 28, which are basically smaller diameter uh, core wires compared to gauge 18, 16, 14, 12 used in the electrical system. Please keep in mind, this is one of the places that some new students get confused about, or like the people who are new to IT get confused about, the smaller the AWG gauge, the bigger the conductor diameter. Do not get confused about this during an exam. You may get this, these exam questions on your, you know, whatever the exams you're taking. So keep in mind, smaller is bigger, bigger is smaller. That's why the electrical wires have a smaller AWG compared to data communication wires. So the data communication wires are actually diameter wise smaller compared to electrical, but have a higher AWG or the American wire gauge or gauge because the gauge is always opposite. You need to think opposite. Right, keep that in mind. Why it is opposite, I can prove it mathematically why, but I'm not gonna go into that detail here today, but keep that in mind because they do show up on exams. So let's look at the gauge and categories of cables. So Cat8, Cat6, Cat6A, Cat5E, Slim Cat6 and Ultra Slim Cat6 all have different gauge types. And this does matter in certain applications. For example, I'm not comfortable using a slim cat six cable uh, on a uh, device that use a very high voltage of power over ethernet. I would not use that. Like, let's say we have everything wired in cat six regular cable with 23 uh, American gauge, and I'm not gonna use an ultra slim cat six cable of 32 American gauge for the last patch panel uh, sorry, last patch cable to install a like a very high power drawing uh, um, a power over ethernet cable because I don't feel comfortable that's gonna work properly. So that's why you need to take into account what type of cable you buy. So the CAT8 have a 22 uh, gauge, CAT6 have 23 gauge, CAT5E have 24 gauge and so on and so forth. And you can see the diameter goes down as you go down this list and as a result, that you know that the CAT6, uh, sorry, CAT8 cable would have a bigger diameter of uh, solid core or a core inside uh, compared to CAT6 uh, cable. So, you know, because of the diameter uh, going down as you go down here. So again, well, as I mentioned, for me, when I'm installing cables, if I have to use power over ethernet with a very high power drawing, um, uh, higher end spectrum uh, devices, I usually go with uh, cat 5 e uh, non slim uh, or cat 6 non slim cables because of the gauge difference so does this have an impact on uh, your data transmission yes it does it does have an impact how do i know this because you can simply by looking at it you can see the cat 8 cable have a 22 uh, gauge 
compared to CAT 5, we have a 24 gauge. That means by going from 22 to 24, you basically reduce the diameter and hence reducing that capability. However, however, the CAT 6 regular cable have 23 gauge, but CAT 6 ultra slim have 32 gauge. So how is this even possible? The reason for that is the gauge is not directly proportional to the data transmission rate. Keep that in mind, the gauge of the wire is not directly proportional to the data transmission rate. That's why you can have a CAT6 cable with 23 AWG and you can have a CAT6 um, uh, Slim Ultra with a 32 uh, AWG uh, with a even smaller uh, diameter. So keep that in mind. So while I'm more comfortable with using regular cables, you know, like it's no, you know, it's not the the data transmission rates are not directly proportional to that of the gauge. What really matters is a category because remember, category will guarantee minimum standard of operation, and that's what we are interested in as cable installers. Again, you can use UltraSim Cat6 cables for uh, you know power over Ethernet applications. It's just I don't recommend using that. Uh, because I rather have the thicker gauge wires for especially for those ones. One more thing I want to point out, if you pick a wire that is really low gauge for an application, um, that means you're going to have a thicker diameter cable. If you pick a wire that have a very high gauge, that means you're going to have a thicker core diameter. That means the thinner one most likely to produce more heat especially in PoE applications. So thinner wires gonna have a more heat because of the, the wire is thin. So keep that in mind. Again, I will go into detail on a different lecture, but for now, just keep that those in mind. Now we're gonna discuss a uh, jacket rating. So we're gonna switch gear. We're gonna discuss something called jacket ratings. So jacket or, or seat is the one that goes outside the cable. Okay, so the jacket is the outside the cable and there are different ratings associated with your jackets. Those include CM, CMG, CMR, CMP and CMX. So I typically use the CM, C, uh, uh, CMR, CMP, CMX, but so some people also may use the term riser, plenum and outdoor because of the use case scenarios. So CM slash CMG are communication general purpose cables. They are used in patch panels, in-room cable runs, and not ideal for using risers and planum. Uh, planum is basically ceiling space, as I was talking about. The ceiling space, if you're pulling wires uh, in the ceiling space or duct space, those are called planum spaces. And CM, CMG are not typically recommended. You can use it, it will still work, but they are not recommended. Also, this is, can be a regulation or code law break if you actually use in plan, uh, plan, uh, plan spaces. Uh, so, so keep that in mind, plan spaces, um, I think, it be, I believe this is pronounced plan, not planum, uh, plan spaces, so keep that in mind uh, because it may be not uh, fire, it could create a fire safety issue. So keep that in mind. You don't use CMCMG typically on those uh, uh, confined spaces. You uh, can substitute these with CMR or CMP as well because they are okay to use uh, sub as a substitution because obviously this is the lowest uh, type. So going any higher would be fine for substitution. Riser, also known as CMR type K rating, uh, used for communications. Uh, so a riser is a vertical space, typically inside walls between uh, between and between walls. So if you're pulling cables between walls, uh, to a wall plate, CMR cable is uh, typically recommended and those are used for in-wall uh, insulation and may be required due to uh, insurance or uh, contractual clauses and also legal reasons. As I mentioned, legally in most parts of Canada, you can use CM, CMG cables in uh, flame sp space, but you can uh, use CMR cables. And the substitution is going to be CMP because that's the next level up and uh, you can't use 
CM uh, or CMG here because that's going to be next level down so we can substitute CMP. CMP also known as plenum cables. Uh, those are a communication plenum space uh, which is the space above the floors and typically occupied by heating and air conditioning ductworks and you can put some of these cables inside the ductwork too. In most scenarios it is, won't be any illegal uh, you know it would be fine in terms of code and low as long as you use the CMP type cables. So the air ducts and plum uh, above and uh, below the floors uh, and may be required uh, due to insurance contractual clauses as well as a legal requirement for your jurisdiction. So keep that in mind. Also another thing, if I have a choice of putting a cable right next to or inside a heating duct versus a cooling duct or an air duct, I will always pick the air duct or cooling duct over the heating duct. Uh, just to even though the CMP cables are maybe rated to even go inside the heating ducts just to keep it uh, cool you know why would you want to put a cable uh, when you have a choice of putting in a cooling duct or a um, air intake duct when you you know why would you want to put it inside a, a heating duct right so I always uh, do that in my house I actually try to separate the cable as far away from uh, the uh, the heating ducts as possible so it does not touch in the heating duct just to be safe even though I'm using CMP cables in my house. Then we have the outdoor CMX cable this is the most expensive cable out of all of these types of cables here and these are outdoor rated cables typically have low density polystyrene LDPE which I'm going to discuss in my uh, next few slides and it is used for exterior insulation and can be buried or exposed to moisture, UV light, etc. And the cable run up to about 50 feet before you need to be terminating those cables. Um, but you can get an expensive 100 feet cables nowadays. I saw in the market, you can buy it, uh, but the cost is gonna be significantly increased. And there is no subsidy to CMX uh, at all. Like you can't substitute this to anything else above here. So we're gonna discuss uh, uh, special applications. Uh, special applications includes the power of Ethernet, which I have discussed quickly a couple of times, limited power applications, OLP, outdoor ratings, uh, plum spaces and rises, which I also talk about. And one thing that I have not discussed, which is the antibacterial cable. Now you might have the question, what the hell is an antibacterial cable? I will describe that quickly here. Uh, so that you have an idea. So let's discuss the power of Ethernet. So PoE or power of Ethernet is an, a type of networking devices that draw power via Ethernet cable. Either you are using the PoE injectors on the other end or you have a switch that is capable of supplying the power uh, through the port uh, itself. Now those include things like access points, security cameras, sensors like the security sensors, IoT devices like Internet of Things devices, those include like um, things like humidity testers, uh, detectors, temperature detectors. Uh, IoT devices also include the lights that turn on when you walk into the space, for example. So those kind of etc. etc. So because these cables are drawing power, that's why it says power over Ethernet (PoE). You need to make sure that you the type of cables that you are using can handle the type of power it's, it is drawing. For most security cameras, sensors and IoT devices and access points, most Cat5e and Cat6 cables are good enough. It's going to be fine in any manufacturer, it doesn't really matter. What may be a factor that you may want to look into manufacturing quality of your cable with the, with the excuse me, PoE, uh, is that if you are putting cables in industrial applications uh, where the PoE power draw is much higher and you are putting cables uh, outside the building where it is exposed to elements with power over Ethernet. So keep that in mind. You need to buy good quality cables, uh, especially with power over Ethernet, you are putting outside in industrial applications as opposed to home or uh, inside building applications. Limited power or LP applications, those are introduced by UL in 2015. UL is another standardizing body and that supports something called PoE++ applications with over 60 watts. Even though it's called limited power applications, what, uh, the, what that do is uh, they it support a PoE++ applications that can have more drawing of power. So you can speak to your cable manufacturer when you're buying uh, for your customer There's, before you purchase it to make sure that it fits for your need. Outdoor ratings, 
direct burial and aerial so there are aerial cables as well so what are the difference between a direct burial outside cable uh, and aerial cables uh, basically direct burial is basically you can take the cable and without putting any additional jackets or anything like that you can simply direct bury the cable so if i have to uh, take a ethernet cable from my house to my um, uh, separated garage in my house i will buy a direct burial cable they are safe they are easy to use there are no, no, nothing to worry about uh, things like lightning strike for example is less likely to happen on a direct burial cable than an aerial cable and i would go and buy an either direct burial cable direct burial cables are expensive but it does the job it is cheaper than actually sometimes putting a tube or a cable in in the in the mud or you know in the soil and also direct barrier cable have special coatings uh, that uh, can, that will uh, not degrade uh, to when exposed to things like soil aerial cables you probably seen in the infrastructure situations uh, where um, you know companies would put aerial cables uh, on uh, poles it's just like electrical cables uh, so if you go to like for, let's say if you go to amazon warehouse or if you go to google data center they probably have some aerial cables that going across uh, to their uh, for example their security cameras so the security cameras is outside and they don't want to bury the cable for whatever the reason and they pull it the cable uh, in the air and that would be aerial rated cables so keep that in mind you, again, I already discussed the flame spaces and risers. You need to make sure that you buy the proper cable. And finally, the antibacterial cables. Not a very popular cable, but this type of cables are also in use in specific situations. For example, if I am actually installing a exposed cables in, uh, let's say, in a hospital environment or a laboratory uh, research, biomedical or a chemical laboratory research environment, uh, they my customer may ask me to install an antibacterial type cables. Those are cables that are like any other Cat5e, Cat6, Cat7, Cat8 cable, except the outer coating will have a specialized, special, um, you know, coating or a, a jacket. That jacket is rated for antibacterial cables. Antibacterial cables also do another thing. That is, uh, some of these cables with PVC and other uh, jackets, if you expose to things like, uh, let's say, like uh, sanitizers, the cable jacket will degrade really fast. Like, if you are working in a hospital and you have a patch cable that connected to a laptop and every single time a medical doctor or nurse comes in and clean that patch cable with a... Uh, antibacterial uh, chemical that patch cable jacket could wear out but with antibacterial specialized cables that are designed to be used in this kind of environment you can keep using the uh, you know uh, the chemicals to clean the cable and cable jacket will not degrade so that's why we have these antibacterial specialized cables again use case scenario as an IT professional as a technician, as a network cable installer, you need to discuss this with your customer and use it accordingly. So keep that in mind. So what should you choose, right? So again, you need to discuss with your customer about the uh, or car clients uh, about the budget. So if the customer or client have an unlimited budget, you can put Cat8 cable if you wanted to. Cat8 even not even properly standardized yet. But if you want to go to the best standardization, you can go to, for example, Cat 6A is pretty much well standardized right now. So if a customer is willing to spend that money, you can go ahead and uh, do that. So if you're building a new house, for example, and that house comes with uh, some network cabling installations, you can, um, you know, uh, request uh, the cable installers to install Cat 6A cable, the, uh, the house builders to install Cat 6A cable over Cat 5E cable. Right. If I if I'm a cable installer for a brand new house, that's what I would ask my client. Hey, do you have the budget for a Cat 6A cable? And this is the cost difference. And if you are willing to go with it, we can go with the latest technology. So you need to discuss with your customer. You need to explain to your customer the differences. Explaining to an I uh, you know IT professional about differences such as an IT team is completely different ball game than explaining a different concepts associated with cabling to a management team or an end user. Some management teams have embedded IT technicians, IT professionals, engineers within them. Some management teams don't. So 
You don't need to be an IT person to be a manager of an IT team, for example, in many companies. So in that situation, you need, as, as, an, as an IT professional, you need to explain to the management team in their terms how those differences work and why, why they are matter. The same goes for explaining to an end user. If your end user is a client who is a home user, you need to explain to their level to understand their concepts associated with cabling. In fact, I found even IT professionals don't understand the importance of different cabling and cable types. Uh, for example, a lot of IT professionals I seen sometimes incorrectly uh, bury Cat 5e cables uh, in the ground. You can do that. You need to have a direct burial cable. Otherwise, it's going to degrade. I seen uh, um, you know some IT technicians uh, put uh, Cat 6 uh, and Cat 5e cables outside the building without any you know an exposure to expose the cable to the sunlight or uv light and that's going to degrade the cable so even it technicians need to be educated on the differences in uh, those cables if you are a cable expert if you are a cable technician that should be your job in terms of what is the difference between cat 5 and cat 6 you know or a cat x and cat y you know should i upgrade from cat x to cat y, y, so cat 5e to cat 6 or a cat 5 to cat 6a. That's all something to do with you know cost benefit analysis and how much data throughput you really need, how much bandwidth you need within that network. Uh, can you mix cat 6, uh, sorry, cat x and cat y and if the network gonna work? The answer is yes, it will. You can have uh, the entire infrastructure building with cat 5e cables. Uh, and then put the last bit in CAT6. It's just going to create a bottleneck. And the same goes the other way around. You can have the entire infrastructure in CAT6A cables and you can have CAT5E on the last bit. No problem. It's just going to create a bottleneck. All uh, CAT uh, X or Y, Z cables are the same? No. They're not. So basically, if I get CAT5E cable from one manufacturer and CAT5E cable from another bit manufacturer, uh, maybe one cable is significantly cheaper than the other cable even though both are rated as cat 5 e cables if you get like for example if i get two cat 5 e cables from amazon for example and one is really cheap one is really expensive even though the same length and everything is same there may be reason why it is that maybe the jacket of one of the cable is cheaper than the, the other jacket the other jacket is made out with better material compared to the jacket of the other cable remember what this categorization is doing is it is categorization, it is basically guaranteeing a minimum standard uh, use case scenario. It is basically guaranteeing minimum bandwidth, guaranteeing minimum quality of data transmission. It is not guaranteeing the outer jacket. It is not guaranteeing how the outer jacket will be built, for example. So if you see two Cat5 e cables, one is $30 more expensive than the other, there may be a reason why. So keep that in mind. Not all um, you know, CAT5 cables, not all CAT6 cables are created equal, even though they are rated equal. So keep that in mind. Rating only give you a guarantee of minimum bandwidth and transmission rate and use uh, scenario for the packet switching. It is not guaranteeing the cable quality, the quality of the outside of the cable, for example. Do cheap, ca cheap cables uh, work just as well? Yes, in most scenarios, the cheap cables works just as well. But I always make sure I buy the good quality cables from a well-known manufacturer if I'm installing cables in uh, inside wall space, uh, inside uh, flam, flam uh, space, like the inside the ducts, et cetera, et cetera, just so that I don't have to go back and uh, you know rewire the whole building again because I bought cheap cables. So keep that in mind. So rule of thumbs or rules of thumb. For business and enterprise, it is all about the technology and cost versus benefit analysis. No business gonna go out of their way and reinstall CAT 6A cable uh, by replacing CAT 5E cables uh, unless there is a direct benefit to that business. Unless the business management people are stupid. You know, There's no reason to waste money. 
uh, for something, you know, just to get the latest technology. So for the business and enterprise, it is all about the technology that they use inside the building and the cost versus benefit analysis. If it is a technology company that use the highest speed, highest technology, highest internal communication systems, they might ask you to upgrade their uh, cabling infrastructure maybe every, uh, every decade, maybe even that, you know. But for most business, not even that. So that's what I mean by that. I know there are buildings in Calgary, for example, Calgary, Canada, uh, in net, in engineering and technological industry, they still use Cat5 e cables from a decade ago, or Cat5 cables from a decade ago. So keep that in mind. So for the businesses, it's all about a cost versus benefit analysis and the technology they use. For consumers and home user scenarios, it is the maximum internet download speed. I'm telling you this because majority of internet connections in the world are asymmetric internet connections. In Canada, all cable internet and all satellite communication internet and most cases, almost all network connections are asymmetric except in some, some uh, service providers, ISPs have now started to offer symmetric internet. So what is asymmetric internet? What is as uh, the symmetric internet? Asymmetric means Basically, your download speed is faster than your upload speed. So all of us probably have in North America 100 megabyte per second or gigabyte per second download speed, but most of us have upload speed maybe uh, maximum 50 megabyte per second. The reason for that is for majority of internet applications, what really matters is the download speed, not the upload speed. So what we are looking at is the asymmetric speed. So when you are talk, speaking to your end user or client, what we really need to focus on is the download speed because download speed is much faster. For for example, if your user come to you and say, I have an internet connection that have 100 megabyte per second upload speed, 1000 megabyte per second or one gig download speed, what you really need to look at that download speed because these are asymmetric internet, not the upload speed. So keep that in mind. So that's what I mean by maximum internet download speed. For most consumers and home user scenarios, Cat5e and Cat6 is more than enough uh, for gigabit ethernet download speed for asymmetric or even symmetric internet. As long as the symmetric internet is not more, no more than 1000 megabyte per second. So keep that in mind. The reason why I talk, talk about all this download speed because most of the internet connections are asymmetric. I have never in my life have come across an ethernet, or oh, sorry, internet network connection, ISP connection, which is asymmetric where the upload speed is faster than the download speed. So that's why I always focus on the download speed. I never seen somebody having a faster upload speed than the download speed. So the bandwidth and the speed of download is what really matters. You also need to take into account the current local area network equipment. For example, if your home user or a small business user have network attached storage with 8K or 4K videos that they use or a CAD files, for example, they have very large engineering CAD files on a NAS network attached storage. Make sure that you put at least CAT5 e cables within the building as well as think about putting in CAT6 cables at that point because internal network connection going to be much, much uh, faster than the internet connection and your user will use it because for 8K uh, streaming from a NAS will use the entire bandwidth if given the opportunity to use. It. So keep that in mind. Also, you need to think about future internet and equipment needs of the customer. So if you are working with a small business or a home consumers, where they are telling you that, hey, uh, my son going to install a NAS within next few weeks and we're going to put all our family videos in 8K or 4K in there and we all want to watch it. Don't put cat, maybe, you know, cat5 cable, put at least cat5e cables or cat6 or higher and explain it to the customer and why the cost is higher and the benefits associated with it. So those are the rule of thumb that I can give you. And with that, uh, that will bring us to the end of this lecture. And uh, if you have any questions or concerns about anything that I have covered in this lecture, please feel free to uh, reach out to me. Until next time, please thumbs up this video and subscribe to my channel and have a nice day.